Psalms 130, the Bible says, verse number 1, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Mark that in your Bible. If God kept every sin in remembrance, who could stand before God? Huh. I like what Miss Caitlin's saying. Who am I? Wonder that verse, who am I? But I'm glad that's not the final authority, aren't you? He goes on to say this in verse 3. You'll underscore this. But there is forgiveness with thee. And I'm glad when God forgives it, it's gone. Never to be remembered anymore. Says, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Hmm? The word feared means reverenced. You find somebody that God forgave a whole lot of sin for, I'll show you somebody who loves God and reverences God. Verse number 5 kind of goes along with what Miss Brittany's just saying. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in His word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you again that we're able to come this morning and worship you. We enjoyed the good choir singing. We enjoyed the good special singing. We've enjoyed fellowship. We've enjoyed Sunday school. We've just enjoyed being free. We've enjoyed what we have in Christ. We've enjoyed the fellowship with thy people. Lord, it is so good to be able to assemble. Now, I understand there are some who choose not to, and that's between you and them. And I understand that there are some who would love to be able to come but can't because of their compromised immune system or because they're sickly or they're elderly. And Lord, I pray you'd bless them and bless them abundantly. But I pray now, Father, you'd help us from the Word of God. We need some help. We need some instruction. We need some encouragement. We need our faith to grow. And Lord, you're the only one who can do any of that. So we lean on thine understanding. We, Lord, submit ourselves unto thee, asking you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Now help us this day to appreciate the goodness of the Lord. And Father, will not fail to bless you and praise you for it. For it's in the holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple things. In verse number 1, we find the psalmist is in despair. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. He's in despair. Some of you may be in despair. There are folks all across this country and all across the world that are in despair. They are living in a situation that is bigger than them. They cannot control their environment. They cannot control what is going on. And they have no hope. Can I say, I don't have any more answers than anybody else. But I do have hope. Brother Tommy and I was talking just a minute ago about folks in this world that have no hope. It doesn't matter what comes because I know in whom I believed in. And I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm glad my hope is in Christ. Uh, I appreciate uh, what the president has done in these dark days. I appreciate all the medical people and what they have done. I appreciate uh, how many in our country have rallied. Uh, I appreciate those things. Uh, And I'm glad God gives uh, men wisdom. But they are not the final authority. They are limited. I know the infinite one. I know the one who is unlimited. I know the one who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. And I just choose to put my trust in him. But make no mistake, they were in despair. There are a lot of people that have fears. And it may not even have to deal with what our country's dealing with. It may be emotional things. It may be uh, psychological things. It may be uh, uh, fear living in their household. Uh, There's no telling what folks are going through, but I do know we live in a world of despair. Notice, if you will, the dependence. Thank God this psalmist knew who to depend on. 
In verse number 2 he said, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Uh, listen, they can do a lot of things, uh, 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 but they cannot take him away from me, and they cannot keep me from calling upon him. Uh, Notice his dependence is on the Lord. Uh, uh, he's looked to his right and his left. Uh, he's looked all around. Uh, he's heard all the advice from everybody else, but they can't help him. Uh, but he knows one who can. Uh, and he chooses to depend on the Lord. Uh, can I help you with something today? Uh, uh, put your faith in him. Uh, depend in him. Uh, look unto him, the author and finisher of your faith. Uh, uh, depend on God, and he'll help you through whatever you're facing. Notice the deliverance verses 3 and 4. He says, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Thank the Lord there is deliverance. I'm glad there's always a way of escape. I'm glad there's always help from the helper. The psalmist said, I look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Who's your helper? His name is Jesus. He is able to deliver you out of all your trials, all your temptations, all your troubles. He is the delivering one. But notice his desire in verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. The writer of the psalmist has been forgiven of the Lord of his sins but he's still in despair. Can I say there are a lot of people saved, but they're in despair. They're troubled. And notice his desire is to just wait on the Lord till the Lord helps him out of his despair. Can I help you? You need to learn to depend on the Lord, and you need to learn to desire the Lord to move on your behalf. Mm. be a great day in your life when you choose to look to him and then we see the declaration he makes now again he's not been delivered from his despair he's been delivered from his iniquities from his sin from his unequal dealing with God but he's still in despair but in his despair God begins to do a work in his heart because he's about ready to make a declaration to other people to trust in the Lord and can I say while you're in despair, God is growing you. God is working on you. God may be waiting four days to do something miraculous in your life. But even if He doesn't, He's still worthy to be worshipped and to be praised. And that's what the psalmist is doing here in verses 7 and 8. Let Israel hope in the Lord. Now, he's not been delivered from his despair. But look what he says. Uh, even though the Lord hadn't shined on me, you still need to hope in the Lord. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Uh, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Sure. Can I say, even when I'm troubled, he's still worth telling others to put their trust in. Mm -mm. And so we find this wonderful psalm, and the psalmist that put these words together by the moving of the Holy Ghost, but I'm interested in verse number 1. In verse number 1, he says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. With God's help, I want to preach for just a few minutes this morning on out of the depths. Out of the depths. Can I say, there's a lot of things you can think that that means, but this is what that phrase literally means. It means... A sense of being swallowed up. Have you ever been in a situation that you feel like everything's caving in on you and there is no way out? Have you ever felt like everything else is just closing in on you? I've used in times gone by, used to, you'd see it on Tarzan, you'd see it in Westerns, you'd see it all over the place, something called quicksand. Hmm? And uh, 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 they, they began to swallow them up. And no matter how hard they fought to try to get out, they couldn't get out. Thankfully, in every one of them shows, there was a branch or a vine that they could grab on and pull themselves out. Huh? I've got good news to, for you. We've got a righteous branch. His name is Jesus. And he can get you out of your quicksand that's swallowing you up. 
those fears, uh, those anxieties, those things that seem to be closing in on you, making you feel claustrophobic. You can be in a room this size uh, and yet feel like you're smothering. That's what that phrase really means. Can I say Jonah gave us some perspective on it, and here's the biblical definition of out of the depths. Jonah in chapter 2 verse 3 says, For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, the flood and the floods compassed me about, and the, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. He said, I'm being swallowed up. That's what it means. And can I say, if you're not careful, trying to live for Jesus, trying to read your Bible, trying to do what's right, you can still feel like you're swallowed up. Out of the depths. I got to thinking about the depths that swallow people up. Can I say there's the depths of sin? Can I say sin closes in on people? It smothers people. It destroys people. Can I say that sin brought defilement? Before sin, everything was perfect. After sin, everything became cursed. Uh, everything became defiled. Uh, everything became hideous and heinous in the sight of God. Uh, 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 sin defiles. Uh, sin never makes anything better. Uh, it always makes things worse. Uh, sin defiles. Sin brings forth death. Uh, for the wages of sin is death. Uh, nothing ever died till sin came about. Uh, and now everything dies because of sin. Uh, you say, Brother Doug, if God's so great, why is there this fire? Why is there the flu? Why are there other epidemics out there? I'll tell you why. It has nothing to do with God. It has all to do with sin. Sin is what allowed all these things to happen. Sin brings defilement. It brings death. But sin also brings damnation. Can I say death is not the end? Uh, uh, there is life beyond the grave. Uh, and those that die in their sin, an uh, 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 eternal damnation is waiting upon them. Uh, can I say this? The effects of sin are heaviness. When you were lost in sin, under conviction of that sin, the weight of the sin weighed on you. Uh, but when you got saved, that heavy burden was lifted. There are a lot of folks who are heavy hearted today because of sin. You're saying, are they wicked, sinful people? I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about the effects of sin is heaviness. Can I say a child of God who has sin in their life has the weight of the world on them. Sin brings forth heaviness. The effects of sin is not only heaviness, it's helplessness. A lot of folks that are lost without God under the weight of sin don't know where to turn. Some turn to alcohol. Some turn to drugs. Uh, 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 some turn to all other vices for the flesh uh, only to find no lasting satisfaction. Uh, uh, some sign up for all the overtime they can get. Some sign up for everything else uh, in the world. Uh, they get involved in everything and nothing brings eternal satisfaction. Mm, sin has an effect of heaviness. It has an effect of helplessness. But in the end, the effect of sin is hopelessness. How many, when they've lived a long life and they come down to the end of it, they don't believe God can save them. They have no hope. Amen. They die in their sin because sin brings hopelessness. Even folks that don't reach a deathbed, there are folks out here that have uh, 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 dallied in sin so much they don't believe God can save them. Uh, uh, the song that Miss Caitlin sang, the words of that song, Who Am I? That overwhelms us like the psalmist said, uh, 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 Who am I that the King of glory would take note of me? Uh, uh, but can I say those that are lost in sin uh, and have uh, 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 delved into sin, uh, they don't believe that God's grace and God's goodness can reach where they are. They feel hopeless. There's the depths of sin that swallows people up. But then I thought about this. There's the depth of salvation. Hallelujah for salvation. I'm glad I got swallowed up and saved. Are you listening? 
I'm glad the more I, I find out how saved I am, the more uh, 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 swallowed up I become. Uh, 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 the, the greater this thing called salvation is. Uh, uh, the Bible says this in uh, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, uh, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, here it is, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and height, uh, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, uh, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Uh, I'm talking about the depths, uh, the breadth, uh, the length, uh, the height of salvation. Uh, when you get to thinking of how saved you really are, uh, how good God really is, uh, uh, what God really did for you, uh, it truly uh, weighs in on you and blows your mind. Uh, uh, when you get to thinking about the depth of salvation's cost, uh, what Jesus paid for you and me uh, how he left glory uh, how he uh, came into this world uh, uh, he was in the presence of sin uh, yet he never sinned uh, he lived a sinless life uh, went to the old rugged cross uh, uh, laid down his life uh, shed his precious blood uh, for you and for me uh, hey the depths of the cost of sin uh, it'll overwhelm you uh, when you realize that Jesus loved you so much uh, that he took you your sin on himself uh, that he sacrificed himself for you uh, and if you would have been the only one that believed on him uh, he'd have still done it uh, when you realize that the holy God of glory uh, uh, came into this world uh, uh, to become filthy uh, and die for all sin uh, hey, the cost of sin overwhelms you uh, you too will cry who am I the cost of the depth of salvation. I got to thinking about uh, the depth of salvation's calculating. Do you ever stop and think how God orchestrated everything to get you saved? Do you ever think about who got saved before you and then who told you about salvation? Who you watched who you worked with, who God used in your life uh, to show you there is a way that leadeth unto righteousness. Yeah, and somebody around you had God on them, uh, and it began to weigh on you, uh, and God orchestrated uh, everything. Uh, uh, you could not get to where he was, uh, but he came to you, uh, and he orchestrated, and he worked, uh, and he changed people's lives around you, uh, and he got to working on you, uh, got to dealing with you, uh, and then brought you to a place uh, where you could hear that Jesus loved you, uh, and that Jesus died for you, uh, and that Jesus would save you. Uh, hey, and you got convicted of your sin, uh, and God didn't leave you alone, uh, and he kept dealing with you, uh, kept wooing you, uh, kept drawing you, uh, and finally when you had all you could take, uh, you came to him, uh, and you laid it all down at his feet, uh, and you believed on him, uh, and he saved you, and he changed you, uh, all that God orchestrated for you to get in, that overwhelmed you. You go back and you read church history and how many people died for you to even be able to come to church today uh, when you realize how many uh, 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 paid a sacrifice uh, and how many uh, uh, forged the way uh, and kept planting churches uh, and how America was formed uh, for free religious freedom and how everything orchestrated and calculated to the day that you got in. Uh, that away on you. I'm glad I'm swallowed up. I get to thinking about the height, the length, the breadth, and what God had to do in order to get me in. Oh, what a Savior. Uh, I got to thinking about the depths of salvation's cleansing. He cleansed us from all sin. Think about that. First John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as He's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all all sin. Amen. Brother Clint, he just didn't save you from the sin you needed to be saved from to get to heaven. He saved you from all sin. He made a way where you'd be so cleansed that you can talk with him anytime you want to. I'm talking about sin separated us from God. But Jesus restored us to God. 
He cleansed you so well that in His sight you're not a sinner anymore. Now think about that. I don't know if that does something for you. That does something for me. To think, Miss Angie, that he loved you so much he not only died for you and saved you, but he cleansed you from everything you'd ever face in your life. Can I say, uh, uh, Brother Clint, when he saved me, he cleansed me from my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins. He sealed me with the Holy Spirit. He sealed you. And he said that inward man, he said, it sinneth no more. Uh -uh, When God looks at you, he never sees you ever sin anymore. You know what he sees? He sees himself. I mean, when the blood's applied, uh, Jesus looks in the mirror uh, and he sees himself. Hey, the depths of that. uh, Because I fail his grace every day. uh, I'm sorry, no good every day. uh, I'm not worthy to call on his name every day. uh, But not in his sight. uh, When he looks at me, uh, he sees himself. uh, He sees me cleansed. uh, He sees me uh, uh, never as a sinner at all in his sight. uh, He sees glory. uh, I don't see see nothing but filthiness uh, but he sees glory uh, he sees holiness uh, he sees righteousness uh, because I'm roped in his righteousness uh, and the depths of his salvation friend uh, is much bigger than me Uh, it's much bigger than you Uh, he saved me so good uh, one of these days I'm going to step out of this flesh and go to glory hallelujah the depths of salvation boy that'll do something for you you realize what it took for you to be saved and how saved you really are. That'll help you, huh? I got thinking about this. Not only the depths of sin, not only the depths of salvation, but there's the depths of satisfaction. Huh? Listen, I hadn't got over being saved yet. Y'all know my testimony. I've told you a million times. I'm going to tell you again. Got saved third Saturday night, March 1974. And, and that night, I don't know how many people were there, but the building was pretty full. And that night, my granddaddy was preaching, but somewhere in the middle of his message, uh, it, it wasn't him that was preaching anymore. Somebody bigger than him showed up uh, and began to preach to my heart. Uh, and that night, I don't care if it had been 5,000 people in the altar. Uh, I'd have jumped over every one of them. Uh, I needed to get to Jesus. Uh, I don't understand this crowd. It feels like you got to uh, beg people and prime people and pull people. Uh, that night, uh, it was me and the Lord in that place uh, and I had to get to him uh, and nothing was going to keep me from getting to him uh, that night I hit the altar uh, when I got up my white haired uh, granddaddy looked at me and said boy uh, are you satisfied uh, I can tell you 46 years later uh, I'm still satisfied uh, in the work Jesus did in my heart that night uh, and I tell you every time I think about Jesus uh, every time I read the word of God uh, every time I hear a song that lifts him up uh, I'm still satisfied in what he does. Uh, Can I say there's the depth of a satisfaction? Believers are satisfied with the liberty Christ grants. I'm not in bondage. I've been set free. And a lot of our loved ones that think we're crazy for coming, they're still being bound by something. You say, preacher, are you saying they're not saved? I'm not saying that. There's just some that are bound. Some are physically bound. They have an immune system. They're sick. Uh, they're physically bound. Uh, there are others that fear is binding them. There are others worry. There are others stress. Uh, they're just bound by something. Uh, but when you truly uh, uh, get to thinking about the depths of Him uh, and the depths of satisfaction start swallowing you up, uh, uh, you are set free from all that garbage. Uh, and I bless the Lord. How can you really explain to people what Jesus has poured in your heart? You can't even explain it. You don't even know what it is. I'm just saying, I've been swallowed up by Jesus. That's all I'm saying. Uh, The satisfaction he gives, uh, uh, we just get satisfied in the liberty that he grants. We're satisfied in the love of Christ, the love that Christ instills. I I can't explain it. I could meet somebody I never met before and just love them. Uh, I can see a sinner in the depths of sin and just love them and care about them. I I can just uh, see folks that are hurting and just love them. I can even have folks talk to talk about me like a devil and I still love them. I just can't explain it other than the fact 
that it's just part of the satisfaction that God's been so good to me and God's forgiven me and God loves me. Yeah, shame on me if I don't love others. Huh? Can I say believers are satisfied with the longing for Christ appearing. You know how I know somebody's satisfied in their salvation? They just can't wait till Jesus comes. Hmm? Huh? Say, preacher, he could come today. That, ups- that doesn't upset them at all. They say, glory. Yeah. You know how I know somebody's not satisfied in their salvation? You start preaching on the Lord coming and they get real nervous. Amen. Say, preacher, I'm ready to go, but just not right now. Well, I'm ready to go right now. Huh? Let the trumpet blow. I'm out of here. Hallelujah. Huh? Why? Because I'm just satisfied. And one of the, these days, the word of God is going to be satisfied and the trumpet is going to blow. And I bless the Lord. I got to thinking about the depths of satisfaction. You get to thinking about how saved you are and how satisfied you are with what Jesus has done. It's hard not to come to church. It's hard not to worship. Listen, I said this Wednesday night, I'm not trying to be a martyr. I didn't put a gun to any of y'all's heads and told you you had to come to church. I'm not trying to be some hellion that you know, tells the governor to stick it. I'm not trying to be rebellious. I'm just being saved. You see, I heard a guy on 700 WLW the other day ragging on folks that are still congregating. And the host was a Roman Catholic. He says, well, we live stream, and everybody's talking about live stream. We don't have to come. I understand live stream imparts information. But you see, church is more than information. This is a part of me. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. And I'm part of the body of Christ. And this is part of me. For you to take church away from me, you might as well cut my arm off. This is part of me. Where else would I go? I mean, this is just a, a, a more than a way of life. This is spiritual food. I mean, uh, 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 they don't have any problems with people going to Kroger's and getting natural food. Uh, well, I need this to survive. Uh, this is my spiritual food. Uh, I need the things of God. Uh, I need God's presence and God's people. That's a part of me for 46 years. I don't want to go back to what it was. I'm looking forward to what's ahead. Mm. Well, I got to thinking about the depths of God's service. Mm. Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. That's why I didn't let that chick interview me. I know that's not a proper term. I didn't let that broad to interview me. Uh, I don't do this for men. I kept trying to tell her, well, We're here to worship. I'm not doing this to be a spectacle. I'm not doing this for... You know what I hope they see? I hope they see there's some folks that still love Jesus. But I don't want them to see me. But what I do, I want to do heartily to to, to the Lord. I'm all in. I want to give it my best. But it goes on to say this in verse uh, uh, 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. There's the depth of service. Serving Christ brings rejoicing. The happiest you'll ever be is the busiest you are for Christ. When you are serving Jesus Christ, you are rejoicing in your heart. You're happy. Doesn't it make you feel good doing something for somebody else? It does. It don't matter how little or how big, there's just something about helping somebody else. There's just something about showing the kindness of God to somebody else. Miss Annette says it all the time. She says, we'll hear of somebody doing something great for somebody, somebody giving a lot of money and doing something, really impacting people's lives. She said, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do that? And it would, but we don't have that, so we'll just do what we can. And when you do what you can, maybe it's dropping a card in the mail. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's just a little kindness, a little green handshake. Uh, uh, Maybe it's just uh, being there for somebody. Uh, But when you serve uh, others by serving the Lord, it brings rejoicing in your heart. Uh, I can't can't explain that to you. You know, the, the way of the world is get, 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 get all you can. 
But the way of being right with God is give, 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 give all you can. And when you give, it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's rejoicing and being in God's service. You want to know a miserable Christian? Somebody don't serve God. Somebody just goes through the motions. Somebody just shows up, and they're a taker, not a giver. They're not happy. You know who's happy? Giver, giver, givers. And I want to be happy, happy, happy. Don't you? Huh? Can I say this? Serving Christ brings reverence. Brings reverence. Is that not what verse 4 of our text says? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. When you serve God from your heart, it brings a natural reverence to God. You see, He expects me to do what I can, then He does for me what I cannot do for myself. But when I do what I can, it causes me to appreciate Him more. It causes me to reverence Him. It causes Him to get glory from my life when I serve Him. It brings reverence. That amazes me. Dr. Phil, how any old dumb hillbilly like us can bring glory to God. Yeah. Amen. But when we do what we're supposed to do and serve Him, yes, He gets glory. Amen. Huh? That's why I didn't give the interview. God wouldn't have got any glory out of that. So I don't need to be any part of that. And can I help you something? We're to do what we do heartily unto the Lord. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It brings rejoicing to us, but it brings reverence and glory to God. But can I say this? And when you get to thinking about all this, it just blows you away that God would allow us to bring glory to Him. Miss Glory's home with the Lord. has been there a long time. I'll never forget. It was old, old Bill and she used to sing that song, I'm a trophy of grace. God takes the most vilest of sinner. Saves them, washes them, cleanses them, and then sets them up for the world to see. See, look what I did. Nobody else could do that. Yeah. I did that. Yeah. And we become a trophy of bragging right for God. You say, preacher, give me some scripture for that. I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, Satan came before the sons of God, before the throne of God, accusing the brethren. Uh, and God, not Satan, God said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Uh, God said, Look at this trophy right here, planted right there. And hey, the devil even said, You blessed him too good. Uh, hey, I want to tell you something. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, but when God chooses to use, us, uh, it brings glory to God. Uh, can I say? Service and serving Christ also brings rewards. That's what it said there in verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Wouldn't you think just having your sins washed away be reward enough? Amen. Think about it. What else does he need to do? But you see, that's just not God. He gave the example in Luke. He said, uh, he pours in, pressed down, shaken, bubbling over. Shall men give it unto your bosom? The Lord says, I just don't ever do just bare minimum. Saving you was bare minimum. He said, but now I'm going to add to that. And I'm going to bless and bless and bless. And it blows my mind to think, as good as God is, as sorry as we are, even after we've been saved, He'd be justified throwing us off into hell. Uh, but He's not going to because I already told you, He looks at us as we're holy and righteous in His sight. And uh, if that's not enough, God says when you get to glory, uh, I've got a crown of glory for you. Uh, I've got gold, silver, precious stones for you. Uh, I've got a reward for you. Uh, I'm making you join heir to my throne. Uh, what's mine is yours. I don't understand all that. Uh, but I bless the Lord uh, that he even thinks of us in that realm uh, that'll swallow you up getting thinking God loves you so much he's going to reward you uh, he said in my father's house and many mansions we're not so I told you huh? Y'all know I used to drive by that big fancy place down there off, off of turkey foot to, uh, uh, and tell preachers that's my house and they said wow God's been good I said no this, this won't even be a dog house where I'm going huh well, I used to comment on that. Make a that sucker blew. That sucker burnt down. I'm glad I'm going to a place where fire doesn't burn down my mansion, huh? Yeah. Glory. Yeah. 
That blows me away thinking about all that God has if we just serve Him. Can I say I serve Him because I love Him, not because I want a reward? Because all He's done for me, it's just natural to serve Him. But can I tell you, it sure is good being a child of the King. Hmm? Huh? Let me say this. I got some illustrations I could use on that. That one I got about Abraham Lincoln. I'll tell it. Some of you haven't heard it. Huh? Two boys in front of the White House playing. They'd have a good old time. One boy said, Boy, I'd sure like to meet the man that lives in that house. The other boy says, You want me? He said, Yeah. He said, Come with me. He said, Went through the kitchen, went through it, ended up in a big boardroom. There's a cabinet meeting going on, all the heads of state there. And he barged right in there. And, 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 and the president looks at him and says, Son, what do you want? He said, Dad, this, this friend of mine I got here said he'd like to meet the man that lives in this house. So Abraham Lincoln closed the cabinet meeting down, sat there and talked with that little boy and made over that little boy. He said, what, what are you saying? I said, it's good being a child of the king. Uh, anybody wants to meet the king, I can just take them, show them, introduce them to him. Are you listening? Huh? Hey, being a child of the king has its privileges. <laughs> Old Todd Lincoln didn't have to go through security to get to the president. Are you listening? Huh? The hounds of hell may try to keep me away, but I have an access with him. Hallelujah. Huh? That blows me away. And I thought about this. I thought about the depths of steadfastness. And if anything other than salvation hasn't meant much to you today, you being here today, this point ought to help you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The world don't understand why we're here. But I'm here because of that verse right there. And many more like it in the Bible. It says, be you steadfast. Now, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Can I say a wolf howling at the moon when it's full? That's what the wolf's supposed to do. A bird singing in the trees. That's what a bird is supposed to do. That's what God created him to do. Huh? The grass growing toward heaven. That's what God created it to do. We we'll mowed mine on Friday. Needs mowed again. I mean, thank God for rain, I guess. Huh? But I'm trying to tell you, God creates things to do certain things. He created us to worship and glorify him. When sin got in the way, he made a way where we could be restored to him. And it is a natural thing for Christians to want to just be like him. Hmm? Every little boy wants to grow up and be like his daddy. Until he becomes a teenager, he thinks his daddy's an idiot. Every little girl wants to grow up and be like her mama until she realizes mama does a whole lot of work around the house. She said, no, I want, a, I want a maid to do all this when I get older, huh? But can I say... Every child of God, if the Spirit of God truly is inside of them, wants to be like Jesus. Amen. We take on His nature. It doesn't happen overnight. He has to cultivate some of us. Some of us spend a lot of time in the world. He has to get all that out of us. But He indwells us, and our desire is to please Him. Can I say... When you start pleasing Him, and you start studying, you start reading the Bible, you realize what pleases Him is faithfulness, being steadfast. He told, Paul told young Timothy, preach the Word, be, in, be instant in season and out of season. When it's easy, when it's hard. When it's right, when it's wrong. When heaven's inside or when hell's ablazing, preach the Word. Here he says, be steadfast, unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord. There is a depth of steadfastness that many will never reach. Many will never grasp. Many will never embrace because it doesn't mean that much to them. I want to tell you something. If you truly get a hold of the depths of salvation, the next thing you want to do ought to be able to please Him. And when you start studying what it takes to please Him, God's not impressed with shiny things or flashy things. God's impressed with steady things. Can I say? In being faithful, steadfast, 
you will face obstacles. Yep. You'll have elected officials tell you to stay six feet apart from one another. Yet I've seen many videos where they're in a crowd of a bunch of people. I told Brother James Wednesday night, this thing's not as serious as they're letting it on. You know how I know? Every day there's a press briefing from the White House and the President and the Vice President are right there together. If this thing really was an epidemic, they'd have them in two different parts of the country in case something happened to one of them. That's all you need to know right there. Hey, when 9-11 happened, hey, Bush was in a plane going one direction, Cheney was in a plane going another direction. It's all you need to know. It's not as serious as they prescribe it. But even if it was, that verse is still true. And you're going to face some obstacles. Miss hmm? uh, Nett showed me, I don't know what church it was, so don't ask me. She showed me some church was trying to reach out to all the members, so they was giving them a little card of encouragement and toilet paper and leaving it on all their steps. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, my problem, Brother Ray, is folks will tell us that we can't come here. But they'll go to Kroger's. They'll get toilet paper, and they'll get milk, and they'll get pop, and they'll get whatever else they get, hopefully Swiss rolls. They'll get all that stuff. Somebody else has already touched that. Somebody else has handled, many people's handled that. It's been on that shelf. People have come by that. They've breathed on it. But that's okay. Because you need all that stuff. But you don't need this. Hmm? Au contraire. I need this. The Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You're going to face some obstacles. You're going to be steadfast. There are going to be things that get in your way. Number one, the world don't like it. Because every day you're faithful, your testimony against them. The devil don't like it. And a lot of other folks that are even saved don't like it because it's an indictment against them because they're not faithful. You'll face obstacles. Can I say this? You will face opposition It's one thing to have an obstacle in your way. It's another thing to face an enemy. And can I help you something? The devil's not in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. The Bible said he can be transformed into an angel of light. And he can put thoughts and words in people's minds. And he, even can, he can even use some of the people that are very closest to you. You're going to face opposition. There's some people just not going to get it. And there's some people going to fight against you. Yep. And there are some people that want to prevail against you. There will be some people who will want to make an example out of you. You'll face opposition. If you're steadfast. Because every day that you stand true to Jesus, you're a black eye to the devil. You remember what the Lord told Adam and Eve that their seed would bruise his head and he'd bruise his heel. Now he's talking about the Lord Jesus, Genesis 3.15. When Jesus came and he died on Calvary and rose again, that was a big black eye to the devil. Oh, the devil bruised his heel. He did die. But he bruised his head. Now if Christ is in you and you're in Christ, every time you st remain steadfast, every time you overcome, every time, guess who, guess who you're kicking in the head? The devil. And he don't like it. And he'll stir up whatever he can to oppose you. Being steadfast, being faithful, you'll face obstacles, you'll face opposition. James has got coronavirus back there. But here's the good news. You can overcome. Steadfast people always overcome all odds everything that comes against you the Bible says in Romans 12 21 be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good 
How do you overcome? Be good to people. It's hard for people to, to punch you and put you down when you tell them how, much, how good Jesus is, how much you love Jesus, how much you love sinners, how much you love them. Boy, it sure is hard for them to hit you. You know what they, they eventually do? They'll say, yeah, you're right. What else are they going to say? How many times did they come and try to get Jesus, only to be marveled that Jesus just disappeared from their midst? Or how many times they wanted to lay hands on him and they couldn't? Because it wasn't their time. It wasn't his time yet. Hmm? Can I say something? You're not going to go till it's your time. Don't overcome them with evil. Don't get on their level. Don't act like they act. Just overcome them with good. Be good to them. Smile at them. Say, I just love Jesus. Hmm? Uh, Jesus has been faithful to me. I can't be unfaithful to him. Hmm? The Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You overcome obstacles and opposition by faith. Amen. There's some things you can't explain. You just believe them. I don't know how God keeps this world spinning on its axis and gravity keeps us in place, but it just does. I don't need to know how he does it. I just believe he does it. I don't need to know how things work. I just need to know the one who makes them work. And looking and talking with those that oppose us or those that are obstacles before us, what are they going to do with I just believe Jesus is bigger than this. What are they going to do with that? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I just believe that. Amen. I'm just going to be faithful. Your faith speaks much louder than anything you can really say to them. You can overcome. You can overcome. And then the Bible says this in Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So I'll just choose to hang with Jesus and he'd be proud of me. Yeah. And he'd be my father and I'll be his son. Listen, the boys are here. You can ask them when they was little. They never worried about if we was going to ever eat. You can look at them. They didn't miss any meals. I mean, when Christian gets nicknamed at the academy, hog jaws, that says it all. Huh? They gave him shirt sizes for uniforms. They said, you go to academy, you'll lose weight. He got bigger. Had to have all of his shirts altered. <laughs> uh, they never had to worry about food being on the table. They never ever have to worry about gas being in the cars. They didn't have to worry about anything. They just got to be little boys. They got to play and fight as brothers and do what they did. Why? Because mom and dad was the one that had to take care of all that, make sure they got fed, make sure they got where they needed to be, make sure they were clothed, make sure that all their needs were taken care of. Now, you can worry and fret about it and everything, and when you do, you take the crown from the Father and put it on your head. And you know what God says? He says, okay, if you want to handle it, handle it. That's why you don't get any peace. That's why you don't get any joy. That's why the obstacles and the opposition defeat you. But when you realize, I don't have to worry how he does it. I'll just let him be the Father. I'll just be a son. I'll just enjoy life and let him handle it all. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's got all the answers. Why do I need to figure it all out? I'll just trust in him. Faith will cause you to overcome. Hmm? Every time they start saying, but what about this? But what about this? I just believe Jesus is bigger than that. Well, what about this? I just believe the Bible. Well, what about that? I don't know. I just believe Jesus. What about that? I just, I just think God's bigger than that. I just, I don't know. A lot of people afraid to come to church because they might get something and take it home or take it to somebody else. But they're not afraid to go get gas and they're not afraid to go to Kroger's. They're not afraid to go to Walmart. They're not afraid to go to Walgreens. They're not afraid of all that stuff. Aren't you going to get something there too? You're going to run into more people at Walmart than you are here. It's not a virus problem. It's a faith problem. 
Is there a virus? Sure. There's all kinds of viruses. I wish I'd look up how many diseases there are in the world right now. Hmm? There must be disease ugly because a lot of you got that one. But can I help you with something? I just, I said it from the first day. I just choose not to live in fear. I'll just walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. Hmm? Listen, when you realize the depths of how faithfulness speaks volumes to the world, it'll absolutely swallow you up that you think that just little you is impacting others. And friends, are that, isn't that not what we're called to do? But after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. I have no idea how that reporter heard about us. But I know one thing. She wouldn't have came in had we not been steadfast. Amen. Hmm? If nothing else, somebody's taking note that we love Jesus. They may not understand it. They may think we're crazy. They may want to try to figure it out. But they have to take note that he means more to us than anything else that's going on around us. So, I encourage you not to get swallowed up with despair and fear and discouragement and all the things that are very prevalent around us. Get swallowed up by Jesus and what he's done for you, what he's doing with you, and what he's going to do for you. And friend, that'll propel you in this world. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. <clears throat> as folks are coming they're coming to get a song let's pray Father we love you thank you for the Bible thank you for church God's people thank you Lord that we could come today and hear from heaven Father thank you for all the good singing the precious scriptures and the response of thy people. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless this time of invitation. There's some facing obstacles and opposition increase their faith. There's some, Lord, that needed to be reminded of where God brought them from. Some, Lord, need to be more busy in service for you. Lord, there's a lot of your children here and they need some help, and I pray you'd help every one of them. Then, Father, I pray for any that might be here and that aren't your children. They've never been saved by the good grace of God. I pray that some way, some small way of us keeping the doors open today, you've orchestrated for them to be here and hear that Jesus loves them. I pray the sweet Holy Ghost of God would draw them, they'd come and give their heart and life to Jesus. Father, bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts. Or maybe somebody here today is just, just real anxious and maybe you want to send one of your saints by their way just to go be an encouragement. God, just let the Holy Ghost move and speak and help your people to discern and follow. We'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.